Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with Environmental Defense Fund today for this Inside Solutions webinar. Today's event is Meet Methane Set, Fighting Climate Change from Space. In each Inside Solutions webinar, we take a deep dive into a story from EDF's quarterly member magazine, Solutions. We give you an opportunity to meet some of the environmental heroes we feature in the magazine. We'll hear them talk about their work and you'll have a chance to ask them some questions of your own. My name is Shanti Menon. I'm a senior writer and editor of Solutions and I'm your host today. If you aren't already a subscriber to Solutions, I'll let you know how to become one at the end of today's event. With us for the next hour are three experts from the MethaneSat team. They're gonna tell us about this audacious project and why it's gonna make such a big difference in the fight to save our climate. You'll hear a brief presentation from each of them, and then we'll have about 20 minutes after the presentations to answer your questions. You can enter those questions anytime by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Let's meet all our presenters. Cassie Eli, Cassie Ely, pardon me, Peter Vetter, and Tom Melendez. Thank you so much for joining us today. Cassie oversees the day-to-day -day management of MethaneSat. She's been at EDF for 10 years and she's been with this project from the beginning. She's gonna give us an overview of MethaneSat from how it all began to some very recent and exciting developments. Peter leads ground system development and mission operations for MethaneSat. He's going to talk us through how the satellite functions and what it's going to be doing as it orbits the Earth. Tom Melendez is an aspiring unicyclist, but more importantly for us today, he's the person responsible for taking all that satellite data and turning it into information that people can use to reduce methane pollution. Before Cassie begins, we have a short video to share with you. As EDF members and donors, you are helping make this extraordinary project possible. There's no other environmental group attempting anything like this, so we want to thank you for your support. Get ready to meet MethaneSat. It's a bold idea to be able to take a small sat, this is a new field, and begin to use it for environmental purposes. Nothing else can have this sort of near-term impact at such a low cost. The fact that a single satellite can help us put the brakes on global warming is truly remarkable.
All right. Hi there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Cassie Ely, and I'm from MethaneSat, a subsidiary of EDF. And today I'll be focusing on the need for MethaneSat, the history of the project, and MethaneSat's capabilities. Next slide, please. So let's back up just for a minute and talk briefly about methane's impact on climate change. Methane is an invisible, potent greenhouse gas. It's 84 times as potent as carbon dioxide in the first 20 years after it's emitted. Long-lived pollutants, like carbon dioxide, control the maximum amount of warming. Methane is a short-lived climate pollutant, and short-lived climate pollutants control the rate of warming. So reducing climate pollutants like methane can slow the overall rate of warming. More than 25% of today's warming is driven by methane emissions from human sources, including the energy sector, like oil and gas production, and agriculture. Next slide, please. So about a decade ago, more information was needed to understand the scope of the methane emissions problem. There was a significant lack of data for the US oil and gas supply chain, and you can't manage or reduce emissions that you can't measure. So beginning in 2012, EDF organized an unprecedented series of 16 studies that produced more than 50 peer-reviewed scientific papers that assessed methane emissions at every stage in the U.S. oil and gas supply chain. A synthesis in 2018 of that work published in Science found that the U.S. oil and gas industry was emitting at least 13 million metric tons of methane a year. Now that was nearly 60% more than government estimates at the time. And these studies were a game changer in the US, but we recognize that methane emissions is a global issue as well, and solving it was going to require an ongoing stream of global data. We know that to reduce methane emissions in a meaningful way, you need to understand the location and the amount of emissions, and you need to be able to track that data over time. And that's where this idea of the satellite was born. At first, it was just a what if, but then we started talking to people who knew the industry, and it turned into a how. Over about a year or so, we became confident that technology was evolving to the point where we could, in fact, build our own satellite. It wouldn't be easy, and we would need to push a lot of envelopes, but it was doable. There was a lot of talk behind the scenes, and in April 2018, EDF President Fred Krupp gave a TED Talk announcing that MethaneSat was one of the inaugural group of world-changing ideas selected for seed funding by the Audacious Project, a successor of the TED Prize. And following that announcement, and with the support of many additional investors, we were on our way. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about MethaneSat specifically. MethaneSat is a low Earth orbit satellite. It will detect, observe, and quantify methane emissions worldwide. It'll quantify both uh, from high emitting point sources, as well as emissions cumulatively over smaller source areas. It's equipped with methane and oxygen imaging spectrometers or sensors, and it operates like an inline camera sweeping across a 200 kilometer swath width to take an image of a region. We're prioritizing roughly 200 targets around the world, primarily from oil and glass, excuse me, oil and gas production industry. And we plan to see each of these targets about 10 to 20 times per year, more or less depending on geography and weather. Now we're going to make emissions rate and other data publicly available. And since we know that data alone won't cut emissions, EDF has a strong advocacy effort in place and underway for several years. Now this effort will be ramping up with MethaneSat data as we get closer to launch. Now, speaking of launch, we will be launch ready by late 2022. And the actual launch date will be provided by our launch provider SpaceX at a later date. We expect data to be flowing about three months after launch, once we've taken a look at the satellite and know that it's working properly. Now we have an incredible team uh, developing the science and building and operating the satellite. Ball Aerospace is building the methane sensor spectrometer. Blue Canyon Technologies, now a Raytheon company, is providing the satellite bus, which is essentially the chassis. It includes the power, the navigation, the communications technology, and even the infrastructure that will hold the sensors in place. And we've partnered with the government of New Zealand to build and operate the Missions Operations Control Center. Researchers at Harvard have developed inversion algorithms to calculate how much methane is leaking from any particular location. And with our state-of-the-art data platform that you'll hear about more in a bit, 
will be able to automate that analysis and track changes in leak rates over time. Next slide. And finally, I'm really excited to share with you an update on methane air. So through an award from the National Science Foundation, Harvard and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, SAO, mounted a methane sensor to a Gulf Stream jet. This sensor is similar to the sensor that we're using on the satellite, and we're using the data that we collect from methane air to test and refine the algorithms we plan to use to process the satellite data. Now, our first flights took place in the fall of 2019, and we expected additional flights to take place in 2020, but we all know how that year went. So I'm excited to announce that additional science flights are happening now. Our team is flying in Colorado, in Utah, and the Permian Basin, collecting data as we speak. We're looking forward to analyzing the methane air results soon. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Shanti. Thanks for that overview, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Now, EDF has been monitoring methane pollution in a number of different ways for, for many years now. Have, have we been successful in getting action to reduce methane? Yeah, we've certainly been successful in a number of ways. Uh, one project I was directly involved in was the methane mapping project. EDF partnered with Google Earth Outreach to create a pilot program to map and quantify leaks under city streets from the local distribution system. And as a result of the successful campaign, EDF began advocating for utilities um, and public utility commissions to use advanced leak detection um, and quantification methods in order to identify priority areas for leak repair. And we've seen some really specific uh, changes from some really large utilities like um, New Jersey's Public um, Service Electric and Gas, so PSENG, um, using our leak quantification data We've collaborated with a number of other utilities to uh, map and quantify their system leaks. And it's really, it's a project that led to other utilities being more transparent about their leak management practices um, with both customers and their utility commissions. That's great to know. Thank you, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to head over to Peter and we will hear more from him about what it actually takes to fly a satellite. Peter, off to you. Thank you, Shanti. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today to provide you an overview of how we're going to fly and operate MethaneSat once we've launched it. So I'll give you a little bit of information on that and uh, how we uh, um, send commands to it, how we get the data back, and then how we process that information. Um, I've been involved in satellite uh, systems and operations for most of my career. Um, everything from astrophysics missions to remote sensing missions and even an interplanetary mission to Mars. But MethaneSat is one of the more exciting and innovative missions that I've worked on. So it's great to be here. I've been with uh, EDF and MethaneSat for just about a year and oversee the ground system mission operations uh, for the program. So to start with, as Cassie mentioned, we're going to be launched by SpaceX and they will put us into a polar sun synchronous orbit. Um, after we check out the spacecraft for about 30 days, make sure everything is functioning properly, it's working as we expect, we're gonna slowly raise our altitude over about 60 days to 585 kilometers, roughly 365 miles using the onboard thrusters. And that's the altitude that we wanna fly at for the duration of the program. And the sun's synchronous orbit is a special one. We've chosen it to provide us with global coverage. Um, sun synchronous means that as we cross the equator on the sunlit side of the earth, we cross it at roughly the same local time every day over every point. So for example, if we're crossing the equator at 2 p.m. over uh, South America, we'll be doing the same thing when we cross over Asia later in the day. The Earth will rotate underneath us during the orbit, and that gives us global coverage. And if you unwind the map and see over the course of a day, we get coverage across the globe in different places. Now, because of a quirk of nature, or the bulge at the equator causes the, our orbit to shift a little bit. There's a little bit extra gravity at the equator. So over the course of time, the Earth will, the Earth will cause our orbit to shift a little bit or precess each day. And so we cover a slightly different path on the ground. 
So over the course of time, we're able to cover the entire surface of the Earth and then come back and start repeating some of those same locations. So that gives us a great opportunity to observe methane across the globe at a variety of different targets. So how do we collect that data? So as Cassie told you, uh, methane sat observes pre-selected targets. We don't continuously scan for methane. Um, we have a list of targets that we're developing now to select from. They'll have different priorities. There'll be different types, such as oil and gas sites, agriculture, uh, others. And each target area is about 200 by 200 kilometers. So within those areas on the ground, we'll have multiple sites of interest, maybe wellheads, a production facility, and um, be able to collect data on multiple different uh, uh, sites within a given target area. As we plan each day's observations, we evaluate the potential cloud coverage, winds, weathers, lighting angles, and select roughly uh, 40 targets per day based upon where our orbital track is at any given day. There are other spacecraft viewing constraints like thermal properties. We want to avoid sunlight leaking into the, the spectrometers. So we do a careful evaluation to determine which targets we're going to observe each day. And then we send commands up to the spacecraft to maneuver and capture those targets. Those roughly 40 targets translate into 200 gigabytes of data per day, or about 75 terabytes per year. So each target's collecting roughly five gigabytes, about the size of an HD movie you might stream from Netflix. And the reason that it is so large is, as Cassie mentioned, this is sort of an inline scanner that scans across a target for about 30 seconds. So we not only get an image of the area, but in every single one of those pixels on the ground, we also measure a spectrum. We get a methane spectrum, we get an oxygen spectrum that we use to determine the methane emissions. So that gives us a large data cube of roughly 8 billion data points that we need to use in analyzing our, our observations. So how do we go about getting the information up? How do we go about controlling the spacecraft? Well, we're going to use a series of ground stations that are spread across the globe that are provided to us by KSAT in Norway. Um, you see a picture of one just above there with a golf ball looking dome around one of them. They have sites scattered across the globe that we use to communicate with the spacecraft as we fly overhead. So roughly 20 times per day, we'll send commands up to the spacecraft, what it needs to do, what it needs to point at, when it needs to point at it, when it needs to communicate with the ground. And we also receive engineering telemetry back about the health of the spacecraft. So things like voltages, temperatures, how much data we have available on board, are there any problems? Both of those links up and down are encrypted for security. We wanna prevent anybody from spoofing or disrupting our operations. And then that data is sent to our mission operations software in the cloud. MethaneSat is going to be among the first missions, if not the first, to use a fully cloud-based mission operations system. So all of the software we use to send commands, generate observations, and, and analyze the telemetry information will be hosted in, in and operated from the cloud. Um, that gives us the most flexibility. Most current operation centers use dedicated servers, but this gives us flexibility, agility, resilience. If we have an issue with the software, we can restart it in the cloud. It makes it a lot uh, easier for us to operate the mission. Um, early in my career, I was on one of the first projects to use the internet for a NASA satellite. NASA was a little bit skeptical at the time. So it's kind of a nice um, uh, be able to come back around and actually be the first project to use the cloud to operate a mission. Because it's in the cloud, that enables us to operate the mission from virtually anywhere with an internet connection. So while the software is important, it's the people in the Mission Operations Center that are vital. They're the ones that make the decisions. They're the ones that solve the problems. They're the ones that make sure everything is running smoothly. For methane set, Mission Operations does not look like what you see uh, on NASA for the Space Shuttle or from the Apollo 13 movie. It's really a lot fewer people, maybe one to two. Things are mostly automated. Uh, we monitor for things, make sure that all things are working smoothly. And the plan currently is to have Ball Aerospace operate the mission for the first 30 days to check it out. They're the ones who built it. They know it best. They'll operate it from Colorado. And then we'll turn it over to our partners in New Zealand. Um, we signed an agreement with New Zealand in 2019. 
And as part of that, they've committed to be responsible for the operation of the mission during the life of methane sat. So to start with, we'll use Rocket Lab in, in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. They'll fly the mission for the first year. And then after that first year, they'll turn it over to the University of Auckland, who's developing a space capability, space operations capability at their university. And they'll involve students as part of training and education and really help to develop the space sector in New Zealand. And then lastly, a key part of our operations is LEO Labs, who monitors uh, not only where we are, but also debris around us and sends us any kind of alerts in the case there may be a problem that we need to consider. And actually collision avoidance is one of the biggest parts of the mission that we will be paying attention to. This is just a quick view of the amount of things in orbit around the earth currently. Green dots are active satellites, red dots are dead satellites, gray dots are spent rocket stages and other debris. So it used to be that space was kind of like a two lane highway in the rural country. You rarely saw another car. Today, it's more like the 405 freeway at rush hour in Los Angeles. There's a lot of material, a lot of things in orbit. Current estimates are there's about 23,000 objects greater than the grapefruit, uh, roughly half a million objects that are between one and 10 centimeters in size, things lost from the space shuttle during uh, EVAs. And then there's about 100 million objects that are anywhere between a, a millimeter and a centimeter, things like paint flecks that came off of other satellites, roughly 8,000 metric tons as of last year. And it's only going to grow as SpaceX is launching their Starlink constellation. They currently have 1,700 satellites in orbit on their way to 7,000. OneWeb has 245 satellites in orbit on their way to 900. And current projections are that there are going to be about 100,000 satellites in orbit by the end of the decade. So the freeway is going to become a lot more crowded than it is today. And the reason that's important is that this is an example of a half an ounce of plastic hitting an aluminum block at 15,000 miles an hour, which is the speed at which we are traveling in orbit. So you can see the kind of damage that can happen if you get um, hit by a piece of debris. So that's something we're going to want to track and be ready to react to uh, whenever we get an alert from LEO Labs. Finally, the science data that we've collected, what do we do with that? Well, similar to those communications for sending commands and paying attention to the spacecraft health, during those same contacts, roughly eight to 10 minutes in duration, 20 times per day, we'll downlink all of the science data to the ground to KSAT. It'll then be delivered to our data processing system also in the cloud which is being set up with uh, assistance from Harvard, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, and then our partners in NIWA in New Zealand. They'll run the processing and eventually deliver the data to the web that we can all uh, share. So that's just a quick overview of how we're going to fly the mission once it's launched. It's going to be an exciting time, and we're looking forward to getting it up on orbit. Back to you, Shanti. Thank you, Peter. You know, it's just astonishing to think about how much stuff is out there in space. You know, in your experience, have, have you had any close shaves in space? Yes, um, the International Space Station, for example, um, maneuvers roughly once per week on average to avoid debris. Um, recently, they noticed that there was a hole punched in the insulation on the robotic arm from a small piece of debris that they weren't aware of. And then in 2009, the biggest example of this uh, situation was a dead Russian uh, Cosmos satellite hit an operational iridium satellite. Uh, the two of them broke into about a thousand pieces. Those are still in orbit, creating even more debris. So it can happen. And if you're not paying attention, it can be a really bad day. Thank you, Peter. It's just fascinating, fascinating stuff. Uh, we are going to bring our final speaker on, Tom Melendez. Over to you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom, uh, aspiring unicyclist, uh, avid juggler, uh, but also uh, handling data here at, at MethaneSat. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So you've heard about the, you know, the audacious goal that, that Cassie has laid out, and then uh, the complexity in building and flying the satellite and you know 
there's a, there's a lot going on here, but what's the point, right? The, the point is the data, right? This is, this is what we need. This is, you know, this is, this is how we make change. And so, you know, data is the mission and, uh, throughout all that complexity of, of flying the satellite and uh, sending that data down down to earth um, we're not done there's there's still a lot to do so um, you know so what what's the role here of the data in, in reducing methane and so uh, up until now we really don't have consistent you know or timely measurements we mostly have estimates and that's what organizations are generally providing out there they they're estimating uh you know from their facilities what what methane is is being leaked but they don't they don't really know and and uh, it's not easy to verify there are independent reports that happen periodically um but that's really all we have uh and uh you know through through various, uh, as we're developing these products, we're talking with organizations um, that would love to have this data. And they say, look, we really don't trust these estimates. These, we, we know they're not right, but we don't have anything else. And so from our perspective, uh, providing you know, real measurements is, is a real win for everyone. And so, but with that, you know, we have some responsibilities. Uh, the measurements, you know, they need to be consistent. You know the the observations they they need to be you know repeated uh, you know expected cadence you know and and achievable right um, and where we can you know we'll also work uh, to be able to calibrate or or verify these measurements you know in one way or another to really know that that we're capturing computing and reporting the right thing um, but those measurements also need to be transparent you know as you can imagine these these measurements once released to the, the world will, will drive action, you know, or, or, uh, or could be that catalyst. So really we have to be very clear on, you know, what we captured and how we computed it. And, you know, in that, in that responsibility and in with releasing that data, we understand that the integrity of all of this is critical. Um, we can't, you know, we might see something and it, and it might personally make us, you know, a bit angry about what's happening, but the data, we can't release data that's opinionated uh, or really has significant doubt. It has to be factual, uh, has to be correct um, in order for it to really be, uh, really be believed and acted upon. So, you know, who and when, right? People want to know, like we're, we're putting out, we're going through all this effort and, and launching a satellite. So, you know, who has, con who has control here? Who gets to see what, when? And so, you know, the, the short answer on who is basically everyone. You know, that, that's what we're after. We, we want this to be available to the public. We want, you know, science uh, community. And, uh, we want the investment community. We want local groups, you know, activist groups. We want everybody to have access to this data. And that is the plan. Um, so when do they see it, right? When, when are they going to see it? You know, as as Cassie brought up, we're we're looking to be able to release data, you know, shortly after our commissioning. Um, and when we release data, we are looking to release it to you know, to the public, to everyone, right? This is not a situation where we want to, you know, we're we're going to release it to a government entity or an oil and gas entity first, and then the public gets it later. No, it it has to be out and that's and that's really important to us that that we're not hiding um or not being perceived as hiding anything you know this is data we all need to take action our exact release latency is to be determined and and the reason for that really comes down to um you know we have to make sure that it's that the data is correct and we're going to do our best to you know to make sure that we're releasing accurate data um, from a computing standpoint, which is you know where uh, you know my expertise and, and our team lies, uh, we do plan you know to be able to process this data within you know twenty four hours. That's what we're looking to do. But again, from that point uh, after quality control and such, it probably won't be out until uh, a time a time later. And again, they all, I'll, I'll reemphasize the data criticality or sorry the the integrity of this data really is it really is critical. Um, so what would we see, right? What are we talking about? And so 
you know, you can imagine, um, I don't have visuals to share today as we're still deeply uh, involved in, in user testing and, and things, but, you know, you can, you can imagine, you know, data on a map, you know, flux rates, uh, you know, kilograms per hour or, or in a, you know, or a KM squared region uh, of, of that. But also, you know, more importantly is we're really looking to attribute it to the source, the piece of infrastructure that uh, is emitting that methane. And um, so, so people will be able to see, uh, you know, in most cases uh, with, you know, with the level of confidence uh, that we would also display, like, you know, what's the piece of infrastructure and, you know, where that information is available, who owns it, right? So, so we can really, you know, dig in on who owns this piece of infrastructure that is, uh, you know, causing, causing this leak. So, uh, so it's a pretty impactful data. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at, you know, other, uh, you know, various metadata about the owners that, that we can and, and should share, you know, as that we can pull in, you know, reliably. Um, uh, and this is all going through user testing. So, uh, but I'll also point out here that, you know, full transparency about, again, how this was computed. This, this is really deeply ingrained in the, in the culture in building this product. You know, how, what we saw, how we computed it, what were the other inputs into, uh, you know, into that processing pipeline uh, to actually compute this uh, and provide these results. It is, is absolutely essential that we are very clear about, about how that happened. Um, so, you know, some of the challenges here, this is, you know, we've already, you've already spent the last few minutes hearing about all the challenges uh, in even launching and operating the satellite, right? Well, <laughs> we're not done. Um, to provide this, you know, to the public, you know, the scale and automation challenges are, are, are pretty significant. So, uh, you know, Peter mentioned uh, about 75 terabytes a year in raw data, right? Which is, which is not insignificant, but by the time we're done processing it, we're really looking about, about a petabyte a year of data. Like it's, it's uh, the actual computational load and storage to do all this is, is, is pretty large. Um, you know, one of the key algorithms in doing this is, is uh, you know, uh, a, unique, a unique method that basically relies on uh, an inversion technique to actually, uh, you know, quantify these emissions. And you can, you can think of that kind of simply put as like, if you were to have a video at, at a point in time and you were to play it backwards to see where, to see where maybe the actors came on screen or where they came from, right? That, that's what we're trying to do. We have, we have um, you know, a segment in time where we can see this methane and we're trying to um, bring it back to the source. Uh, and so, uh, and, then, and then attribute it. And we're taking, you know, various, you know, aerosols and wind speed, you know, and various other environment factors uh, along with sensor quality and, and you know, dark pixels and things like that to really, to really understand that. Um, and then, yeah, again, that quality assurance and control, uh, that, that has a computational load as well. Um, you know, there are, not only do we process this data, but there are both automated and, you know, potential human checkpoints in all of this uh, to really make sure that it's accurate. And then I'll just say, you know, what else makes this hard? Uh, driving the change, right? What, you know, Putting out the data is great. I think it's going to tell a lot, but at the same time, we really, you know, part of the mission is driving that change. And so, and so, what is what does that look like? Trying to understand that, um, it it also quite a challenge because we're really providing this this data set on, in this continuous stream that people haven't had access to before. Again, they've seen reports and, and things like that, but you know, this this continuous stream, it, how, do, how do they act? How do they react to it? What, what's a great way for them to integrate it into their own workflows and such? So, uh, you know, some examples there of why this is pretty difficult. Then finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the action, right? And, and, you know, having impact. And so what does that mean? You know, from our perspective, you know, those, those tools and visualizations, what do we need? You know, what's, how do we need to present it in a way that we can 
uh, you know, drive that change. So it's really important to us and we spend quite a bit of effort on it. Um, and that, that digs right down into the, the data formats, you know, how the data is available, um, potential equivalencies that we can restate it as, so again, so that people can really consume it. Uh, partnerships and integrations, right? How do we amplify? How do we extend the reach of our data? Um, again, we want to get it to everybody. We're, we're trying to make something happen here. Uh, it's it's very challenging technology and, and, and cool technology, and, it, and it's fun from a science and engineering perspective, but we have a mission, and that means getting this out to people and, and formats and ways that they can understand and consume it. And I'll just uh, I'll highlight that worldwide benefit again, right? It's, this is not just a report. It's not something that comes out periodically, but we're gonna have this continuous operationalized um, stream of data that you know, entities will be able to log into and, uh, and, and see you know, the, the, the change over time, right? And so um, that's pretty impactful. And I think with that, I will turn it back over to Shanti. Thank you, Tom, for bringing that all back home for us. You know, it's important to remember that, as you said, our goal is not just to be taking pictures from space. We, we want action on the ground. So how important is the, the speed and the accuracy and the transparency of, of our data? Yeah, it's definitely a bit of a tightrope back because um, you, we need it to be timely. Right, the, the data needs to come out consistently in a timely manner that that we can act on it. But we are also, you know, we have to make sure it's accurate. And so, uh, definitely that tightrope act, and it you know it causes us you know technical computational challenges as well. Uh, it, it's it's critical. It's critical, and learning about the the right timeliness. Um, is, is something we're working with our stakeholders to really understand how, you know, how soon do they need it to really be able to act and yet we can, you know, maintain enough time to, to make sure it is, it is valid. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Cassie and Peter as well. Can we get everyone back up on our screens and we are going to turn to the Q and A portion of the event. I'm seeing plenty of great questions that are coming up in the chat, so please keep them coming and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, we do have two other experts who are going to join us for the Q&A. Uh, Mark Brownstein, the head of EDF's energy program, will be here, and Ritesh Gautam, who is the senior physical scientist on the Methane Sat team. So they are also here to answer your questions. Uh, before we get to the live questions, uh, I'm hoping to ask all our speakers something on a more personal note. I'd like to learn why each of you decided to join the Methane Set team. Maybe Tom, we'll start with you since I've got you up on screen. Uh, sounds good. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, I mean, of course, space, right? Space is totally cool and, and fun. But uh, you know, on a more serious note, I, I want to leave a want to leave a world for my kids, and um, uh, this is this is an area where uh, uh, you know my technical experience can directly you know benefit them. And so uh, I was uh, you know honored and, and humbled to be asked to join. Thank you. Can we get Cassie and Peter up on screen as well? Maybe I'll go next. All so right, Peter, there sure. you are. So, I mean, similar to Tom, I mean, I've been involved in satellite missions my entire career, but the objective and the goals for methane set are, you know, one of a kind. They're audacious, as we've said many times but they're also critically important as the IPCC report just highlighted. So the opportunity to make a, a, a worldwide global impact, to work on an innovative mission like Methane Sat, and to work with, a, with one of the best teams in the world, both from the science perspective, but also our international partners in New Zealand. Um, it really is a, a privilege to be able to work on a project like this and make such a big impact. Thanks, Peter. Cassie, how about you? 
Sure, yeah. Um, I'll echo a few things that uh, Tom and Peter said. So uh, back in 2018, I was asked to join Methane SAD. I was already working at EDF, and uh, I'd been working on a number of greenhouse gas and air quality measurement projects using sensors prior to uh, Methane SAD. And although I enjoyed the role that I was in, I really couldn't shake the thought that if I didn't join Methane SAD, I was really going to regret it. Um, methane set has the potential to be one of, if not the most impactful work I'll do in my life to reduce the impacts of climate change, uh, both for our current generation, but also for my young son. And uh, I just, I couldn't pass it up. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Gonna turn to some of the questions that we've been getting rolling in from the audience. Thank you, uh, Cassie. I'm gonna throw this first one over to you. Sure. This is a question from Gail Lawley. Uh, what is the biggest source of methane in the USA and in the world? Uh, sure, so for the US, the biggest source of methane is the energy sector. And in the world, it's agriculture. So the, the one additional thing I'll, I'll add here is that the reason we chose to focus primarily on the oil and gas production industry globally as our primary targets is that it's the lowest cost opportunity and uh, the biggest and most immediate opportunity to make uh, change. You know, this week's IPCC report, which talks about just how much climate change is uh, bearing down on us, requires us to really double down on those biggest and most immediate ways to, to slow warming. And we believe methane sat can do that. Thank you, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Peter, I'm gonna send the next question over to you. This is from mm -hmm. Jane Thompson. She asks, why is New Zealand involved? So New Zealand's involved for a couple of reasons. Number one, they have a very climate focused um, government. They're very interested in climate change. They have a large agricultural sector. So in fact, they're responsible for leading the agricultural science initiative on methane set. But equally important, they've been looking for opportunities to expand their space sector and looking for missions to partner on. And it's actually you know, a great privilege to have them on the program because they selected methane set as the first large scale national mission that they wanted to participate in. So for them, this is sort of their ability to start expanding their space capability, particularly as it comes in terms of satellite operations, but also participating in the science return that'll come from methane side. Thank you, Peter. Mark Brownstein, the next question is for you. This is a question from Claude Phipps. Do we have the laws to act on the leaks that are located? Well, in the United States, we just had a big victory a few weeks ago when Congress acted to restore regulations for new oil and gas facilities that the Trump administration gutted. And we are expecting uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency to not only act to strengthen those restored regulations uh, this September, but to actually propose a new set of regulations that apply to all the existing oil and gas wells that haven't been regulated to date. Of course, we do have some states that have already taken action on this, states like Colorado um, and Pennsylvania and California. But federal regulation is really what we need to get a handle on this in the US. And let me also just say that we have worked to get regulation in place in Canada, in Mexico, and we're expecting the European Commission to propose regulation for oil and gas operations in Europe uh, by the end of the year. Uh, this is truly a global problem. So we need uh, global action. Uh, and I think methane set is really gonna contribute to helping to enforce the regulations and help to encourage other countries to take action if they haven't yet. Thank you, Mark. The next question is for Ritesh. This is a question from Susan Wireman. She asks, how will the data from this satellite be used in conjunction with data from other satellites? And how is it different? Yeah, that's a great question, Susan. Uh, so MethaneSat will provide quantitative uh, methane emissions data in the public domain, as, uh, as Tom and others have said, said on the presentations. Uh, the existing satellite missions provide data on 
atmospheric methane concentrations in the public dom domain, but not, not the actionable emissions data. Uh, so far, there have been two main approaches for mapping methane from uh, satellites. One is the global mapping approach, uh, which, uh, for example, the TROPOMI mission from the European Space Agency has really pioneered. Uh, so that the global mapping approach is uh, really useful for studying patterns in methane concentrations across large areas or countries, and in some cases can be used to quantify emissions from uh, very large area sources like the Permian Basin here in the US. Um, the, the second approach is uh, a high resolution approach, which is focused on detecting relatively high emissions from individual facilities. Uh, GHG SAT is a private company that operates uh, some high resolution satellites. Carbon Mapper is another mission that, that's coming up in a few years' time. Uh, but these systems have a very narrow swath, uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 kilometer. So you, you cannot really use these satellites to quantify emissions from, from an entire oil and gas basin. Um, so, so methane SAT was really designed to uh, quantify area-wide emissions and at the same time quantify uh, and detect uh, individual point sources. Uh, so that, that's, that, those are some of the basic differences. Um, uh, methane sat with its uh, sort of unique combination of a broad swath of uh, more than 200 kilometer and uh, measurements at the highest uh, precision of a tenth of a percent precision and at spatial scales of uh, one kilometer or even better uh, can, can really quantify and detect uh, emissions uh, globally from the oil and gas uh, production sector. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Vitesh. Peter, I'm gonna ask you to answer this next question. It's from sure. Kiran Magyawala. He asks, what is the lifespan of this first methane sat, which makes me wonder, is there going to be another methane sat? So the spacecraft, all of the, the parts and pieces have been designed for at least one year in orbit, but there's no reason that it can't go longer. So we are hoping, we're expecting that it will last four to five years at a minimum. The largest driver will be the funding for the operations costs to keep it flying after the first couple of years. Um, and in terms of future methane set satellites, we'll see, um, there's been different conversations, but we'll have to see where the next focus will be in terms of what we want to look at. Thank you. Tom, there's a question here for you. Uh, this is a question from Bruce and Mary Rose Randall. How are you going to keep the data from being hacked? Yeah, we get that a lot. Um, and it's 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 a very valid concern, right? I mean, you're, we're we're flying over, and we and we have this data, and it really could have financial impacts on on uh, organizations. And so, um, uh, you know, our answer to that is um, simply put, a, you know, a very limited access system, uh, you know, with with golden sources of truth, right? That really nobody has access to. But on a more organizational level, uh, you know, we uh, we are actively recruiting a uh, security member to our technical advisory group and looking to actually um, spin up a security board that will help us uh, monitor and and review our our infrastructure. So, um, so we're very sensitive to that, and, and it's just something we have to be uh, very diligent about um, about who has access and when. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you this next question. Uh, this is a question from Bob Schloss. He asks, will data be given to the countries whose facilities were monitored in advance of public release? How will you avoid hostility or embarrassment by countries that have not reduced their methane according to the data you capture? Well, we are already in the process of doing outreach uh, to countries, uh, to folks in industry, to folks in the advocacy community, to folks in the financial community. The purpose of that is to help folks understand what this project is, the kind of information it 
produce, the quality of the information it will produce, and most importantly, how they can make best use of it. At the end of the day, our goal here is not to embarrass anybody, but our goal is to make sure that people have the information to understand uh, the magnitude of the problem, where it's coming from, and most importantly, how they can use that information to make reductions. That's the key. We ultimately, our goal ultimately, is to make reductions. And the good news is, is that there are a number of countries and companies that we've been talking to who are already working with us quite closely because they're anxious to have uh, the better data and to take action on it. So that's ultimately uh, the goal here. But everyone is going to have access uh, to data, uh, whether you're an industry, whether you're a regulator, whether you are the public, uh, whether you are the financial community, and everyone's going to have access to that same data at the same time. Um, because we feel that transparency is going to be really important um, to building, um, uh, you know, confidence in the work that we're doing. Thank you, Mark. Ritesh, I have an interesting question here that I'm going to throw your way. This is a question from David Thatcher. He asks, is there a role for drones? to do more timely and localized passes? And if so, when might that happen? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think drones are already doing it to, to some extent. Um, so these, these low altitude sensors in general, including drones, uh, have, have these uh, in situ measurements, which directly sample the air and measure the concentrations. Uh, so these are not remote sensing instruments which are on board a satellite. So a drone can provide uh, very good data on, on concentrations and even on the emissions uh, at a facility or even at the equipment level. But its spatial coverage is really limited to that particular facility to, or, or, or a small area. So to be able to really provide uh, global coverage, uh, we need satellites that, that, that operate in synergy and measure um, concentrations and then derive emissions um, globally. So, so th there are some differences between what a drone can do and what satellites can do. There are differences in spatial scales. Thank you. This next question uh, is maybe for Tom. Um, it's from Jan Mares. Will you obtain and release data and locations from individual wells? And how do, you, how do you identify whether methane is from a well beneath the satellite or being blown in by winds from miles away? Um, I might, uh, Ritesh, maybe you want to help me out with this one. I can think, think you might be a little better. I can take a stab, but you, I think you've done a little bit more here. Um, you, you want to jump in on this one or you want me to take it? So can you repeat the question again, Shanti? Sure. Will you obtain and release data and locations from individual wells? And how do you identify whether methane is from a well that's beneath the satellite or being blown in by the wind from miles away? Right. So uh, the data will be granular enough most in most cases to be able to attribute sources to uh, individual facilities or groups of uh, groups of facilities. Um, so, for example, if a blowout happens or if an if a persistent leak is happening at, at a certain emission rate, few few hundreds of kilograms per hour, then the satellite should be able to pick it. But if if the leaks are happening at a very small rate, then then satellites are not really effective for for those kind of uh, emission detection. Uh, but the inverse modeling system that's built into this uh, the data platform that the Tom and the team is building and the Harvard team the Harvard team has pioneered over the last two decades actually inverts those plumes that the satellite will see on a regular basis and the con enhancements in the concentrations and and basically trace those um, uh, plumes back to their source uh, so that that system is 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 being built, it's, it's, it's fairly mature, and uh, we are fairly confident that we'll be able to pr provide data on source attribution. 
And, and I might just really quickly interject that methane air uh, project that Cassie was talking about before is actually part of the purpose of that is to actually test uh, the performance of these algorithms so that we know by the time they go into space that we've got this kind of inversion modeling down uh, to a science. Exactly. So th that's a great point. And methane air data is already showing that there, there are some clear evidences of uh, uh, leak detection or emission detection from wells, from landfills, and so on. So we are already seeing that happen. Thanks. And maybe just uh, to follow up on that one, Michael R. asks, will you also target natural sources, such as marshes, melting permafrost, broader ecosystems? I don't know who wants to take that question, perhaps. Mark? Well, I think certainly the, the methane set is going to have the capability to see methane from a variety of different sources, both natural and man-made. But let's keep a focus. But you know, the fundamental purpose of methane set is to give us the information we need to be able to take action to reduce emissions going into the atmosphere. Uh, there's limits to what we can do to prevent natural methane from going into the atmosphere. But there's a lot that we can do to prevent emissions from human activities from going into the atmosphere. And as Cassie pointed out, the oil and gas industry is one of the largest sources of those human-caused emissions. And we know from other work that we've done in partnership with the International Energy Agency and others, that we have the ability to get something like a 75% reduction in oil and gas methane emissions globally with technologies available to the industry today. What's missing right now is some of the information necessary to make that apparent to oil and gas companies and the countries that produce oil and gas and to help them then use that data to find those sources of emissions and make those reductions. So we're, this is really about fixing what we can fix, which we know can make a big difference. Thank you, Mark. Our time is almost up. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this episode of Inside Solutions. If we didn't get to your question or if you have a follow-up question that you didn't get to ask, please email us at insidesolutions at edf.org and we'll do our best to answer you as quickly as possible. Today's event has been recorded and we'll send the link to all of you soon. Our thanks to Cassie, Tom and Peter and Mark and Ritesh also for being with us for giving us an inside look at this remarkable project. And thanks to all our listeners for joining us today and for supporting EDF. We call those of you who make monthly donations our echo partners or sustainers. It's your monthly support that helps EDF keep looking forward and planning for the future and doing the work we do. If you'd like to become a monthly EDF echo partner, please go to edf.org slash donate. Every donation of $25 or more comes with a subscription to our magazine, Solutions. In each issue, you'll find compelling stories about innovative people working to solve the world's most pressing environmental problems. Again, that's edf.org slash donate. And if you do get the next issue of Solutions, you'll be reading the story that we'll feature in our next Inside Solutions webinar that's going to take place on December 7th. Today, we took you to outer space. In our December webinar, we're heading to the Amazon rainforest. You all know how vital the Amazon is for protecting biodiversity, soaking up carbon pollution, and supporting indigenous communities. And there's been some disturbing news about deforestation, particularly coming out of Brazil. But there's some good news too. EDF has been working on tropical forest conservation for decades. And we have made some real progress. That progress involves some unusual partners who come from different backgrounds and have different approaches to forest protection. And we're gonna need all of them to save this rainforest. So this is really exciting work with brilliant people in one of the most spectacular places on earth. I know you're going to enjoy this virtual trip to the Amazon. So look out for that invitation in your inbox. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to our guests. My name is Shanti Menon. Enjoy your day, everyone.